Um, and yeah, sorry. So um, it's my pleasure to welcome Matthew Lees, who is an associate professor in the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also a faculty leader of the University's Good Systems Grand Challenge Initiative to design responsible AI technologies. Um, I would leave it to Matthew to um, introduce his work himself. And um, so off to you, um, Matt. To yeah, um, looking you. forward to your talk. Thank you so much for inviting me. And you know, one of the at least silver linings of the pandemic is getting a chance to sort of you know interact with people, you know, many more <coughs> internationally through talk events like this. So thanks a lot for having me. Um, so I'll be talking, um, as you know, about uh, content moderation today. And maybe I can just jump right in and then we can um, take any questions as also as we go. Since we are a pretty small group, I would just say feel free if you want to ask a question to interrupt and we can deal with anything interactively as we go. Let's see. So, yeah, so of course, uh, social media technologies and the like are something that um, are incredibly popular. They've enabled us to connect with one another in uh, more ways than we could previously. And you can just sort of see some quick numbers here about sort of the, the large adoption and, and the massive amount of content that's getting um, spread through these kinds of channels. So, you know, by and large, that's a great thing for bringing us um, able to communicate with each other much more easily. Uh, but there's also challenges, uh, which is that not all the content that gets posted on these platforms is something that we might want to encourage or like. So you can see here um, some various kinds of uh, problematic content as identified on a couple of the platforms, Facebook and YouTube. And you can see also just the, the great volume of this. Again, if we have these platforms operating at worldwide scale and lots of people are posting stuff, then there'll be a tremendous amount of this kind of problematic content. And uh, the range of, of how big a problem it is can, can really vary. Um, so, you know, in the United States, um, we had a lot of talk about, say, disinformation around our election in 2016 in particular as, as one example, um, where this kind of um, uh, undesirable disinformation content caused a lot of problems. During the pandemic, there's been a lot of stuff around false, uh, false cures and the like that have led to real harm. So this, of course, this, this stuff can be really problematic. Um, on the flip side too, it's a very difficult thing to sort of figure out how to apply um, these processes effectively because you also end up sometimes blocking content that maybe should be allowed. So in this case, um, a naked picture of a child uh, gets blocked because it, it violates the policy in terms of, of child pornography. But in this case, it was a, a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. And so how to sort of, strike this balance uh, between making sure you're keeping the problematic stuff uh, blocked or demoted while at the same time allowing things like this when the, the boundary can be pretty difficult. So, you know, brief scales, have sort of, as brief challenges I've mentioned is that this is a problem at internet scale. And we have very high accuracy requirements um, because sort of the cost of mistakes is so potentially bad if you let this kind of stuff uh, get out there. Um, what's considered acceptable varies greatly for lots of different reasons, geographically, by platform, it's always changing, and adversaries who are trying to get the problematic content posted will continue to adapt their approaches to get it through. And then at the same time, as I said, we have, there's these issues of sort of accountability, you know, we should have free speech and, and, and stuff, if it is getting blocked, there should be due process in um, how it's removed or how you can um, uh, protest if something's problematic. And in terms of the human review effort that goes into this, um, you know, it's very slow, um, costly, and difficult to scale, you know, given the size of the problem here. So you hear so much in the day in the world today about um, how machine learning and artificial intelligence can do um, anything and everything possibly imaginable. And so um, we would be hopefully great if we could have AI systems that would go and, and handle a lot of this problem for us. Um, unfortunately, it remains the, the case that, again, because this is such a high accuracy and very subtle problem in distinguishing this kind of content, um, it's very difficult at least to have any kind of fully automated system um, involved. 
So what we end up having is uh, often some kind of uh, human in the loop approach. So um, one first point to make is when anybody talks about machine learning, often they, they sweep under the rug the fact that you don't have any machine learning often without people who label data to begin with. So even if you want to deploy a machine learning model, you first have to have often people who are going to go and perform the annotation just to get you started. But then once you have this machine learning model, if it's, if it's very confident in making a particular prediction about a content being problematic, then you can just directly decide whether to block or approve it. And that's terrific. And a lot of the content can be done in this, uh, a lot of the content can be automatically flagged, but often the model is not confident. And then that's where we have to fall back on these human reviewers. So these human reviewers, their decisions can uh, both go out to the final output, they're shown on the right side, then they also feed back into the model to hopefully make the model be better over time. So when, when the pandemic struck, um, you know, and everyone got sent home uh, from the tech companies in, in particular, um, as sort of this article talks about, you know, it was kind of one of the dream of these companies to sort of get rid of the humans, you know, the people who are slow and expensive, and let's just see how much we can run everything with AI. So this was sort of a experiment that ran in practice. And, so as the article says, if you were to get through all this text, is it sort of didn't go very well. Um, and in fact, again, when you have this human in the loop approach, and these, again, the, the, the cycle of content is constantly changing, you really have to have those human reviewers in the loop to keep the, keep the AI models working effectively. So what ended up happening is all these content moderators became essential workers. And so at the same time, you know, they're having to deal with everything else in the world with the pandemic. Um, they're also having to deal with sort of with this problematic content. So they ended up did having to go back in the office and do a lot of this work while a lot of the rest of us stayed home. And this work is um, pretty difficult. So um, the way you can sort of think about this is it's uh, vicarious trauma. So it's not necessarily firsthand trauma that you experience yourself in your own personal life. Um, but you're watching often these images or videos, and so you have that secondhand experience of seeing this kind of trauma. And if this is the sort of thing that you do um, all day, day after day, this kind of prolonged repeated exposure can have a lot of pretty significant um, health effects. Um, also, by and large, uh, these folks are not employees of the tech companies. They're um, subcontracted out, and so they don't necessarily have the same level of health protections as the folks at the main companies have. Um, and there's also a bit of challenge that sometimes, you know, there's um, a bit of, I wanna say, say this, something lost in translation between say, some of the things that maybe the tech companies say should be done and what actually happens on the ground in terms of the contractors who are sort of um, overseeing these folks. And so, you know, as this article was sort of mentioning at the bottom, you know, it's, it's just a known challenge at the scale where these companies operate with the amount of content coming through, how do they make sure they, they meet the accuracy requirements and the throughput requirements um, while also trying to think about um, taking care of the health of the workers um, who are involved in doing sort of this essential work that the platforms really depend on the function. So um, there's been a lot of reporting about this. Um, Casey Newton has done a lot in sort of um, the recent recent years. And uh, out of the UK, um, um, Cambridge Consultants was commissioned by Ofcom to sort of do a report. And so there's a lot of documentation now about sort of these issues around um, the mental health effects of this kind of uh, exposure. And um, in, Communities like um, the Computer Supported Cooperative Work, ACM CSCW and, and ACM CHI, there's been a lot of work at looking at volunteer uh, moderations and the, emotion, the emotional labor of, of volunteer moderators in, in the communities they serve like Reddit. But what's gotten very little attention is um, these sort of commercial uh, platform moderators um, because it's typically, um, they're working in, in closed conditions um, under NDAs where they're not able to share. And you know, companies have naturally been pretty uh, resistant or loath to share much about what happens uh, there. The other thing to say about this is that so many people don't realize that there's actually human moderators making all this stuff work. 
um, they think that, you know, that, that this is just automation that's going and dealing with stuff and don't realize that people are having to look at this content every day. And so that's sort of another form of the emotional labor that goes into this is there's a sort of myth of automation where, you know, often the tech companies want to sell the idea that they have the, you know, the, the AI magic automation that handles everything and sort of, you know, um, uh, draw less attention to sort of all the human labor behind the scenes that's actually often needed to make this stuff work in practice. Um, part of the emotional labor of this work as well is, and this combination of either people not knowing your job exists, or it's sometimes been you know, called things like the worst job on the internet. Um, and so there's a lot of stigma also associated with uh, this kind of work. Um, whereas some content moderators feel like they are sort of the police of the internet, the ones who are keeping the rest of us safe. And that's something they drive, you know, particular um, um, satisfaction in, in the importance of the work they're doing for the rest of us. So this has gotten a little more attention in recent years. Um, Sarah Roberts uh, in particular, I think has probably been the one who's drawn the most attention to this. Um, there's a documentary called The Cleaners you can watch online. Tarleton Gillespie also done some sort of work in this space. So I first became aware of this issue uh, back in 2012 with some of the popular reporting that was happening at that time. And um, I've been working in crowdsourcing uh, for a little over 10 years. I'm doing a lot of the sort of um, either data annotation for machine learning models or kind of building these sort of human in the loop runtime systems where you have this idea that if you could sort of bake um, human intelligence into a runtime system, suddenly you could create this uh, new, compelling, more capable software experience for, for people or customers. So if we can sort of behind the scenes, you know, have this sort of human labor that's inside the application, you don't even know about it doing part of the functionality, all these amazing things, you know, that it makes possible. And so a lot of the work in my community in crowdsourcing and human computation is about we're sort of been envisioning these kinds of, you know, new great applications and experiences we can enable by sort of combining human intelligence um, with automation. But what struck me was so ironic here is here's a case where what we want more than anything actually is to not have humans in the loop because you have sort of this content which is emotionally disturbing to have you know, repeated prolonged exposure to, you really want an algorithm doing it. But here's a case where uh, basically the technology that enables human in the loop is really enabling these people to sort of be, be involved in ways that are problematic. So um, I sort of had this problem sitting in my back burner for a long time uh, until I had a couple of students come around um, who started with a class project, I'm trying to think about some of the things that we could do um, to sort of try to basically enable the people to do the work, um, but not have to say, basically to reduce their exposure, to reduce the amount of content they needed to see to, to do the work. So I can show, we have this live online demo at this URL here. So I'll just flip over there and give a quick, uh, quick demo of that. So here's a, a picture and we have some ideas of some different ways that you might interact with it. And so the goal is I'm a moderator. I want to be able to make my, my decision about whether this is appropriate content or not um, quickly and accurately, but I want to see as little of the content as possible. So in one modality we have with mouse clicks, I just reveal a portion, a small portion of the screen around where I mouse click. And based on that, I sort of control which parts I see. Um, another version we had is mouse over, where as I move the mouse around, something temporarily unblurs and then disappears. So again, I don't have to click anything, but I can just temporarily see something and then hope to make a decision. Or the last modality we had was this notion of a slider here at the bottom, where I can just sort of control the overall blur level of the image and basically just unblur it just enough that I think I can make my decision confidently. So we did that you know, sort of first demo in 2018. We didn't have any user study at the time. We just sort of put it out there. And what started to happen in 2019 um, was essentially all the tech companies started doing something like this to try to reduce exposure in different ways. So um, uh, with video, you can see here, Facebook started giving um, moderators control over blurring videos, or muting videos. 
for images, the transformations have typically been sort of black and white uh, transformations, um, or again, you know, image blurring. And sort of as this quotation sh shows here, part of it is, you know, the actual blurring, but part of it was just simply giving, um, simply the effect of giving people controls that they have some, some great bit of greater agency over what content they're exposed to by itself is something that can reduce the emotional labor. Um, and uh, Chris Harrison at Facebook has sort of been their uh, psychologist who's sort of gotten quoted most around this stuff, sort of talks about, you know, we just, we still really don't know though, like what's the right amount of exposure, you know, when, when things really become problematic. And so that's why sort of these limiting these exposure is uh, so important. So Microsoft, uh, here is an example of their uh, content moderation tool, where again, you can see here in the upper left, they have tools here for enabling for videos, again, black and white transformation or blurring. Um, but neither of these companies had done anything in terms of uh, published research on this. Um, but in 2019, uh, a couple of researchers at Google um, actually started uh, publishing a little bit of work where they were actually working with their, um, with their content moderators looking at with images, um, blurring and grayscale, um, grayscale transformations. And so um, we uh, got around later basically to finishing doing our user study to kind of have a sense for our own work about how this stuff was going to work out. Um, and so with our demo, what we wanted to measure again with these same kind of key things of how accurate could people do the work um, how quickly could they do the work um, and measures of well being? So, various kind of psychological panels. Uh, we did this with Mechanical Turk workers because that was the workforce we had access to. So, you know, a surrogate workforce um, versus, like, say, the Google study where they actually use their content moderators. And so, um, sort of just skipping details here, these were sort of a variety of kind of the measures we looked at in terms of trying to get a sense of. Um, the psychological effects or on the wellness of the workers in, in this stuff. And again, we had sort of a limited study. So this is not like a long-term field deployment where you really see what long-term exposure to this would have, would the effects of that would be. So the first most encouraging things we saw was that uh, basically people could complete the tasks with no loss in accuracy or time. Um, which is pretty exciting um, because again, I think one of the main things that drives potential adoption um, in the commercial sector will be that you can do something that doesn't reduce their bottom line in terms of accuracy and efficiency, but can then again, still enable these workers to, to do the work uh, accurate, or just do it safer. Um, and so in terms of sort of the effort involved, um, essentially, if you measure clicks, of course, the click design had the most clicks. And so that looks the most effortful according to that measurement. Um, similarly, you know, if we look at effort uh, for mouse movement, again, not that much really different. Um, skipping a lot of details, this sort of hover design was the one where we just um, moused, moved the mouse cursor around and we temporarily unblurred things. This was the one that sort of the annotators uh, or workers perceived as sort of most comfortable. And similarly, when we look at measures like of emotional exhaustion, so you can see like some of the questions um, we asked workers. And again, according to these different designs, um, we could see sort of how these different interventions played out. And again, skipping lots of details, I could talk, say more in Q&A if there's interest later. Um, you know, we ended up with a recommendation, you know, that of, you know, of these three designs, which one seemed to be the best one in terms of, again, reducing emotional exhaustion, uh, re reducing emotional affect at the same time of um, enabling the workers to still do this work quickly and accurately. So that was sort of um, where we sort of went in sort of measuring that particular you know, set of design or interventions. So the work what we've done subsequently was this paper we published at CHI this year so those same Google researchers um, uh, were at HCOMP, uh, the, the conference, and we talked about sort of trying to do a, a partnership um, across sort of the university and the companies and trying to look at, look at these issues together if we could. And sort of independently with this also, um, Mariah Steiger, who's the first um, author of this, of this article, uh, reached out to me as well. 
so I started work also at Amazon as an Amazon scholar uh, while I was on sabbatical in 2019. And so while this work was done completely in my university capacity, um, you know, there was three of us then between Google, Amazon and um, Task Us who had um, some awareness of content moderation, you know, happening in the companies we were involved in, as well as sort of having these academic uh, connections. And so we really wanted to try to see what we could do to kind of assess where we were um, in the field and, and try to get people to start talking more about this and sharing best practices from the companies, which again, had sort of been pretty closed uh, previously. So um, the broad overview of this paper was we took a, a social justice perspective um, of trying to think about how we could, um, you know, better support the workers who were doing this essential work. And, um, from my own background and doing a lot of research around crowdsourcing and crowd work, uh, again, there's been sort of a lot of traditional discussion around um, uh, fair and ethical treatment of the workers who are involved in say, providing this uh, data labeling, which is so important to the AI revolution today. So, um, so the first two authors, Mariah and Timmer are psychologists. So that also brought um, a level of clinical rigor to the work that is something that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. Um, and so we partnered with uh, Martin who had been part of my original uh, work here at the university as well as um, Sucrit from, from Virginia Tech. So it was a multi-university, multi-company um, initiative the Google folks ended up getting put onto a different project, um, which is why more or less they couldn't continue with us in the study and they're not on here, but they sort of certainly contributed to our, our formative ideas. So we looked at some of the related occupations uh, where we thought sort of there might be lessons for us to learn uh, to bring back moderators. So we looked at say journalists who might be in war conditions, emergency di dispatchers or sex tra trafficking detectives and the kind of symptomology that folks in these occupations faced as well as the kinds of things, you know, best practices for helping support them in their work. And so what we tried to bring together was a combination of um, programmatic interventions. So this is where um, uh, Mariah and Timmer at Task Us um, are involved in sort of working with um, uh, designing wellness programs uh, for their moderators in practice uh, from a clinical perspective. Um, uh, Sucrit and I could particularly bring some more of the technical perspective in terms of technology uh, interventions. And we, we sort of frame this in terms of what are called sort of primary, secondary, or tertiary interventions. So broadly speaking, primary interventions are where you just try to prevent. Um, so, you know, if you can just keep people from being exposed to begin with, um, or uh, secondary where people are exposed, but you would sort of reduce the amount of exposure versus these tertiary where sort of people are having um, significant effects from the work and what can you do to sort of help them recover. So we tried to get a bit around sort of best practices and future work. So um, in terms of these notions of, of care, so here on the technology side, um, primary interventions, you could think of things like algorithms where of course, the more we can automate, the less people have to see, and that's really great. Um, in terms of secondary, where we're trying to reduce that kind of exposure, this is where we can do things like, again, blur images, grayscale, um, mute, things like this. Um, and the last one is this thing, again, when people have had sort of significant, significant episodes, then what are the sorts of things that you can do to kind of uh, help them in the recovery process? So um, you might know something about like, for instance, if people have fear of heights, you might use virtual reality technology to sort of give them a simulated experience of heights and help them cope with it. So similarly, this is a case where sort of virtual reality um, can be used or has been investigated for, for treatment in these kinds of tertiary conditions. So, so for this primary case, from a programmatic standpoint, what we're trying to do is resilience training. So um, it's really important that essentially folks understand the risks of the work before they sign up for it. Um, if you watch this clean, the documentary, The Cleaners, you'll hear sometimes people say they don't quite appreciate that. And sometimes if you look at the job ads that are posted for content moderation, it's not necessarily clear um, what the level of risk is associated. So really helping people understand that before they do it. Um, teaching the sort of coping or resilient skills um, is sort of the onboarding process. Um, 
showing um, some bit of the problematic content. Again, this is what you're going to be seeing when you do the work and reinforcing the kind of skills they should be applying when they see this kind of problematic content. And then a lot about sort of continually, you know, measuring and assessing what's going on. So part of the paper is really just sort of dedicated to talking about the different kinds of metrics for wellness um, that should be used uh, for assessing um, where you're, where folks are at. And if you are considering different um, interventions or designs, the effect that those are having. Um, um, skipping secondary, because I've said sort of a fair bit about that already. Um, the tertiary stuff, this is again, where you can kind of look at, again, what are the level of symptom of uh, symptoms that, that people are having? And um, this is where, again, you're going to try to have an appropriate, particularly a psychological treatment. Um, so for, um, for these companies, um, it's now you know, more common to have these sort of wellness counselors on site. I think the article I showed previously talked about, say here in Austin, Texas, uh, Facebook had an office with 450 moderators and four or five counselors on site. So it gives you a sense of ratio. Um, by the time you get to sort of uh, tertiary, this is where somebody might get um, referred out uh, for you know, external support beyond what you, know, you can be provided internally. And um, quick thing to mention is also, you know, one of the challenges uh, Casey Newton among others has talked about is, you know, sometimes when people do have pretty significant effects, um, this is something that can last, you know, sort of beyond their employment um, with the particular company and impact them getting work later on. And so thinking about what is the healthcare look like in terms of supporting folks when they, you know, no longer have an employment relationship with the, the particular employer um, where, you know, so where this sort of stuff first arose, uh, arose for them. So some of the best practices to talk about, again, are sort of disclosing risks, you know, again, helping people understand this issue, limiting exposure, creating space. So in this sense, um, we know that people not only getting breaks from the work is good, but also um, filling those, those breaks with uh, diverting activities or, or pleasurable activities. So different ways of sort of, um, of breaking up the work or interspersing it so that you're not just always um, down in the trench with this experience all the time. And then you know, building connection with others so that people aren't isolated and on their own. Um, they're much more likely to, um, to share um, some, of the, some of the things they have, which also can help early detection. Um, one of the problems, particularly for folks, again, who are having to sign these NDAs, is they can't really talk about their work when they go home as well. So there's some of the things that can contribute to the isolation of, of the work as well in that space. Um, and it's not listed here, but you know, emphasizing that identity of the positive role that people are playing in safeguarding the internet for the rest of us. Um, and uh, diminishing any of that sort of stigmatiz uh, stigmatizing that goes along with sort of people who are doing the worst job on the internet because they don't have any better opportunity available to them. So this is about the end and I'm just going to have some brief discussion of some of the things that we've had ideas around in the paper, but they're just ideas of things for things to do to kind of uh, help intervene from a socio-technical design lens. So sort of starting from the simplest level, of course, the more accurate you could make these automated prediction models, um, the less people are gonna have to see. So that's sort of the, the simplest story for um, reducing effects of this as kind of its primary intervention. Another thing is often um, when these models make predictions, they have a confidence about um, how good, how likely they think they got that prediction right. And these confidence values are often not well calibrated. Um, so the model might not be very well calibrated in knowing when it's making accurate predictions or not. And when you have that, that issue, that means you're gonna have to have more oversight of checking the models, uh, verifying the work by human oversight. So the more that we can um, have um, estimates of model confidence that are well, well calibrated with actual predictive accuracy, the more we will be able to trust the model when it thinks it's confident and be able to just go with its prediction and not have a human in the loop having to review anything. 
Another space where there's been a lot of work right now is thinking broadly in AI about uh, model explanations or model interpret model interpretability or transparency. A lot of different terms people use in this space. And the idea is if the model could say something not only about, I think this is a bad image, but here's my explanation for why I think this is a bad image. Those explanations might be enough for people to make a decision, again, to trust the model without having to actually look at the actual content. So not only having the model be confident, but having the model provide explanations that are usable by human oversight to, to know when it can trust the model based on the explanation, again, rather than having to actually review the content. Another thing we talk about is trying to predict the severity of the content. Um, so um, again, some of the things that you'll read about in the popular reporting in this space is people who are assigned, so the content moder moderation teams get um, uh, divided into certain camps. So there are people who only look at certain kinds of content versus other kinds of content violations. And so you could imagine that if you were assigned the terrorism queue and you have to look at things like the headings, that would be pretty disturbing. Um, whereas if you're looking at, say, um, sexual related material, that might be potentially less disturbing. So you could imagine that if we could do a good job predicting the potential severity of content, there's different things that you might do with that. You might think about, for instance, routing the most severe content to people who have different training, uh, perhaps more advanced clinical training for dealing with that uh, more appropriately. You might think about trying to balance the load better so that not um, one person gets all the worst stuff, but maybe you share the load around across people. You might think about that if somebody is having to view some particularly disturbing content, it might be more important for them to have a break or more important for them to get some kind of additional support mechanism. So just something for being able to help us better tri uh, triage, prioritize um, the severity of content would be sort of very useful. Another thing you know, uh, came out of the, the Google folks even suggested was looking at other kinds of stylistic transformations of the content. So if you've ever seen pictures of Google's deep dream, I don't think I have a picture here, I'm afraid. Um, you know, it's sort of like you can take a regular photograph and render it a, kind of a more stylistic artistic fashion. So maybe you can make um, something that would look um, more upsetting in a photo, in a photo realistic way look less upsetting if it becomes uh, put through more of a stylistic or artistic filter. Um, or, you know, if you, for instance, change the color of blood from red to green is the example in the Google paper of just something where, again, you, you put the content through some kind of filter where people can still make accurate judgments. But again, it's sort of less disturbing in this uh, transformed rather rendered content. Um, I um, have had issues in the past with um, repetitive stress, repetitive stress injury. So typing too much of the keyboard. And so one of the things that I used in the past was a program called WorkRave, which would sort of force you to take breaks every so often um, in order to sort of care for your physical health, you know, so that you don't have these repeated stress injuries. And so there's been some work in the crowdsourcing literature on what are called micro diversions. So sort of you know, inter intersecting these breaks, and maybe these are sort of breaks where you have some other kind of diverting activity that happens. So could we sort of more programmatically look at um, managing the work cues of people who are doing this work to figure out what is the right frequency and duration of these sorts of micro diversions to sort of programmatically insert into their, their work, just as the same way that let's say a program like WorkRave does this at your desktop to keep you from having a repeated stress injury. Um, last couple of ones would be, um, so we don't really know how prevalent this is um, in terms of the symptomology. We give a statistic in the paper that, you know, in terms of uh, psych, uh, vicarious trauma in the United States population, you know, what's, what the prevalence of that is. And it is, real, it is relatively low. You know, most people who would be exposed to this will be resilient and be okay. So if we could do a better job of predicting for individual workers, who, who, which workers are more likely to suffer adverse health effects, that is again, another potential thing we could do 
in terms of either designing the volume of work or potentially screening people, you know, during the onboarding process to understand their suitability and capability to engage in this kind of work. Now, there's all kinds of problems in terms of if you're going to manage this kind of very sensitive, um, basically patient data about people, um, doing so in a responsible fashion. And there's also potential risks for discrimination in hiring practices, you know, based on what this kind of testing would reveal. But again, it has it's a potential tool we could use to sort of try to um, care or protect for those who are more likely to be at adverse risk if we could predict that or model it. Last thing I'll say on this slide is um, there's a lot in, very, in many communities about assuming that we as designers or computer scientists know, know what's better for, for other people and that we should basically just put on our thinking hats, come up with a solution and deploy it. Um, the alternative is to say that the people who are doing the work, whether it's content moderation or other kinds of work, are the folks who best know what their problems are, maybe have the best ideas of what are uh, different designs or interventions that would be appropriate and sort of best positioned to sort of think about things in ways that are actually practical, uh, that could be actually, uh, you know, widely applied or adopted in practice. So another thing that one uh, really might do is sort of engage directly with content moderators in a participatory design process um, to really work alongside them in identifying what they see as the key problems and the key potential opportunities for where we might do things to again, ameliorate the work uh, or the, the wellness the side effects, negative effects of the work. So just as kind of briefly mentioned at the start, this is sort of my last slide just to say is, um, at UT Austin, we have this um, grand challenge project where we are trying to think broadly about doing um, responsible uh, AI in a lot of different ways. And so we have a number of these uh, projects. Um, I'm leading one that's really focused on misinformation, disinformation, and, and fake news. And so I've been attending a number of conferences, listening to fact checkers and journalists, um, you know, talking about that work. And one of the things that's really surprised me is to hear them talk about also the these psychological or wellness effects of the work. So um, if you're a, a journalist or fact checker and you're in a forum where you're constantly you know, hearing people say things that are not necessarily true, it, it was remarkable to me here to talk about that they really are at risk of gaslighting effects themselves. It's sort of their own worldview potentially gets um, confused um, without sort of, you know, really doing a lot of things to protect and, and keep, protect themselves and keep themselves grounded. Also, you know, a lot of times disinformation and misinformation online targets particular communities or particular minority groups. And if you're one of those minority groups and you're again, say a journalist out there doing this, you have a lot of these same kinds of problems that you're more affected than, than somebody else would be having to be exposed to this all the time. So these kinds of wellness effects I'm talking about, you know, especially for content moderators, you know, again, it's not limited to content moderators. We had this survey of related uh, professions, but even, you know, if you're just looking at people who are um, dealing with online forums and just trying to do, um, you know, journalistic analysis of fake news or, you know, disinformation, they suffer from a lot of the same potential risks and challenges as well. I also ended up talking with a lot of other researchers during this process who also talked about, you know, challenges in their labs for themselves and then students for dealing with this kind of content and what the things that they try to do to take care of themselves and to be good stewards for their students engaging in this kind of research. So a lot of these wellness practices, I think, extend to sort of things we might practice on ourselves with our own research, um, as well as trying to do things to think about how we can design better for content moderators. Um, so with that, um, I'll wrap up. Just want to briefly thank um, my sponsors, um, the crowd workers who are um, pivotal to so many of my studies, especially you know in this content moderation study I reported on here today, as well as the students who contributed to the work. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.